Well, folks, we have found ourselves in an unprecedented moment in our church history. It's almost surreal and unbelievable, isn't it? How can a, the Pope call it quits? Our Premier did it last night, but you know, Premiers are not in the same league as Popes. We have never had a Pope who resigned for hundreds of years. We Catholics take pride in the papacy as a symbol of unity and stability. We know that Pope Benedict XVI has done this for the greater good of the church, but still we struggle to come to terms with it, with his uh, decision. What makes matters worse for us is the state of the church and the environment in which we find ourselves as Catholics today, particularly here in this country, Australia. We are losing credibility. We are losing believers as well. I'm not very hopeful that I'll win many converts here tonight. Not a very rosy picture by any standard. In fact, the word crisis comes to mind. The church has lived through all manners of changes and upheavals in its 2,000 years history. I love the words of the evening prayer hymn, Change and decay in all around I see, O thou who changest not, abide with me. Some of you might know that, uh, that hymn too. Surely the church will navigate through the treacherous waters of the postmodern world as she has overcome countless obstacles in the past. Yes, I believe she will. Or to borrow President Obama's catchphrase, yes, we can. The church will see through change and decay and trial and tribulation. Nevertheless, we cannot underestimate the seriousness of the moment. We cannot dismiss the unique challenges that we are facing today with an air of triumphalism or a she'll be right attitude. No, what the present situation calls for is humility, not arrogance. Sensitivity, not indifference or apathy. The Second Vatican Council taught us to read the signs of the times and to respond to these signs with faith and courage. And I believe that the signs of the times point to a watershed moment, a transition from the old to the new. It is our task to recognize then to embrace this pattern of dying and rising in the life of the church and in our own lives. So this evening I'd like to share with you my story and the story of the church in living the most fundamental tenet of our Christian faith. I believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, crucified and risen today. I'm not going to give you a theological discourse on the subject that is more appropriate in another context. Here I want to share with you something which is a bit more personal, closer to home. It is how the person of Jesus Christ and his pattern of dying and rising again have impacted on me personally and the way I live my life in the church, it is how faith in the crucified and risen Christ guided us through some of the darkest times in our nation's history and lives. One of the most fascinating dimensions of the creed, I think, is that it shows suffering to be close, personal and real. It does not gloss over it does not try to minimize it or dress it up as if we didn't want to offend the transcendence of God. 
In Jesus we profess without shame or embarrassment that God indeed suffered as we suffer and die. Suffering and death are interwoven into every human experience. By enduring all that is negative, the disillusionment that comes with uh, superficial success, a sense of failure, betrayal by people he trusted, misunderstanding by authority, fear, humiliation, abandonment, loneliness, despair, and ultimately death itself. Jesus, in all of these, shows us how to do the same. So that to say, I believe in Jesus Christ crucified and risen, is to say that I believe suffering can be transcended. It does not to have the last word. It can have a positive result. In giving this testimony, I do not mean to say that I have managed to transcend suffering or that I have mastered the art of endurance. Far from it. I'm just a fellow traveler like you. The hardships that I went through might not even compare with those that some of you suffered and still do. So I don't pretend to know more about the negativity in life than anyone else. Rather, I am merely sharing with you how I learned to walk the journey from despair to hope and from death to life. It is my conviction that we can walk through the Golgothas of our own lives as Jesus did with the same understanding, the same faith, the same awareness of God's love and providence for us as we go. Or we can stumble our way through, bitter and alienated from the very moments that, like His, can bring us to our glory. So here's the story. I was born in the time of the Great Civil War in Vietnam, just a couple of years uh, before the first president of the Republic of South Vietnam was um, assassinated. Any veteran here tonight, perhaps? Aussie veteran who fought in Vietnam? No. Uh, it was, um, as some of you might recall, even if you didn't participate in the war itself, uh, it was the most tumultuous period uh, in our nation's history. Vietnam, unlike Australia and many other countries, emerged out of the shadows of colonialism only to find itself mired in an escalating war. My parents were refugees, both people actually, from the north. You know, Vietnam is a very uh, thin strip of land that runs nearly 2,000 miles. Uh, and yet it's only at its narrowest point, less than 50 kilometers. So it's a very easily dividable country. So, as I said, my parents were refugees from the north. It is a kind of biblical story of Abraham writ large. In 1954, following the Geneva Convention that divided Vietnam into two ideologically opposing sides, communist north and uh, free Vietnam south. A young couple that they were in their early 20s with uh, a, a toddler who was my then two-year-old elder sister. They uprooted themselves from their home near Hanoi and ventured south. They escaped by a small boat and went to a part of the country that they knew nothing about. Why did they and over a million Vietnamese from the north, like them, undertake such dangerous journey to the unknown south? The answer is simple. 
They had seen the atrocities committed by the newly inducted regime in such catastrophic events as the systematic oppression of Christianity, the public trial and summary execution of thousands. They had lived in fear, in terror. So in such an atmosphere, they were ready to exchange everything for a chance to live in freedom, which we often take for granted here. So I thank God that my parents made that courageous decision and instilled in me a sense of risk-taking, courage and hope in every trial. I like the um, re-election uh, speech of President Obama, especially the part where he said that hope is that stubborn thing inside us that insists despite all the evidence to the contrary, that something better awaits us so long as we have the courage to keep reaching, to keep working and to keep fighting. And I think my parents, without putting into those fine words, understood. They really did. They understood what it meant to have hope in despair and to fight to reach that hope. I grew up in a staunchly Catholic village and at the age of uh, 13 I joined the minor seminary near Saigon. But in April 1975, uh, just one year after I had entered, we seminarians had to flee had to escape the advance of the communist troops and the eventual surrender of the South Vietnamese government. I remember vividly when we were on the run from the communist troops during the last days of the war. The roads to the capital were choked with thousands of people carrying their belongings, vehicles, uh, ox drawn carts, um, bicycles, um, you name them. Everything that moved was found on the road to the capital. Some, um, so most of us were running on foot. It was chaotic, like all hell breaking loose. At one point we came under very heavy artillery and everybody dived for cover. We were a family of nine, including very young children at the time. And as we huddled in the ditch by the roadside amid the sound of shelling, people screaming, children crying, we said the Hail Mary as loud as we could. And we thought really that was the end. The change of the government was drastic for us. In Australia, you know, we take for granted certain things like security, stability and continuity, even when government change hands at elections. It was not so for us in Vietnam. In fact, some, in some ways the country was even more chaotic and life was more traumatic after the war than before. Why? Because the communist government applied harsh policies to the population like forced labor, like farm collectivization, that is they um, force people um, to work on collective farms instead of um, on soil or land that um, the people owned. Re-education, -re land reform, and all of these things mirrored the Soviet Union under Joseph Stalin. And then that wasn't the end. Simultaneously it managed to find itself at war with both China to the north and the Khmer Rouge to the south. 
It was then that my parents, fearing for the worst, decided to send the children, the male children in particular, to um, abroad by boat. So I took to the sea in August 1990. The seven day journey itself was uh, terrifying enough. We started out on the Feast of Sinclair, that's August the 11th. And a few days later, we were already in serious trouble. The food had ran out, fuel, uh, water, and just everything else exhausted. As if it wasn't enough, a huge storm gathered and unleashed its fury right near where we were. So again, in desperation, we got out our rosaries and began to pray in earnest for divine intervention. And you can be certain that nobody could physically hear us for the pounding of the waves, the rain and the thunder. No one could but the God who hears the cry of the poor. And it was, you know what? The Feast of the Assumption on that very day. And we were convinced that it was Mary's intercession that saved us, that got us through. I was on board with my sister-in-law and her two young children, 18 months old, and a baby girl, barely five months old. And I ended up holding this little girl for the most part of the journey. It was the most distressing experience I ever encountered. It's watching a young child suffer and you are totally helpless to do anything about it. I think some of you parents might have had that experience yourselves. But that experience of my boat journey was mild in comparison with so many other boat people. They, they were those who were shot and killed. There were those who were lost at sea without any trace. Then there were those who were maimed, and robbed, and raped, and mutilated, and, or killed. Some survived to tell their horror stories, but thousands of, um, upon thousands did not survive. One study estimates that up to half a million of the two million Vietnamese refugees died in the pursuit of freedom. Without a doubt, this was the darkest, the most traumatic episode in the history of the Vietnamese people. And it's something that we will never forget. So for this, I adopted my Episcopal coat of arms, an image of a journey into freedom. As you can see there, the Vietnamese flag in a way before as if to indicate the, the journey by sea. It symbolizes both the spiritual exodus that I as a Christian am called to make and that real painful quest for liberty that I and countless other poor people made. My motto, Duc in Autum, which means go further into the deep, is in part meant to honor the memory of my people who suffered and died pursuing that quest, that dream of freedom and dignity. My experience in the refugee camp was traumatic but life-changing. You see there is a picture of me um, in the refugee camp with some of my uh, soccer buddies. <laughs> I wanted to go to Holland where my two old brothers had gone and settled there. However, after three months of anxious waiting, we were told that uh, only my sister and her children were permitted to go. So I went into a state of depression because I was an unwanted person without a future. Then one day, after my sister and her children had gone, had left the refugee camp, 
going past a classroom. I heard people、uh, try to learn English for the first time, and I just experienced an urge to do something to to help those people. And I began to do something I had never attempted before, and that is uh, um, uh, teaching myself.、Um, and、um, in the process, teaching、uh, ESL—that's、uh, English as a second language—for、uh, the fellow refugees for nearly a, a year. So I discovered the potential that I never knew I had. The disappointment. Uh, of being rejected by the Dutch government turned out to be a blessing. Not only did I learn critical skills in the refugee camp, I was also accepted eventually by the Australian government. Who knows where the course of my life might have led me without that initial disappointment? So, a crisis can lead to a great opportunity indeed. So you can see, in addition to formal education, I have been to a school of hard knocks and have learned a lesson or two from life's painful experiences. It is my belief that、uh, the worst experience can draw the best out of us, and therefore we should always approach whatever challenge we face with a positive attitude. And speaking of challenges, it is not a good time to be a priest.、It's、certainly, not a good time to be a bishop, because of all the negative publicity surrounding the Catholic Church at the moment. And so, you might ask, why did I choose this career and stay the course? And I'd say this, as I said to、um, the students often. That you have to follow your deepest desire and do whatever it costs to realize to achieve that. My deepest desire is to do what Jesus did: to walk with the people, to serve them with love and respect and humility. You have to do what you love, and my passion is to be that sign of hope for the people in their struggles. Their questions and their uncertainties. You know, we Catholics often say God works in mysterious ways, and this is certainly true of the, in the case of Vietnamese people. Thirty years ago, we arrived in this country with、uh, little more than a few documents that we were given in a refugee camp. We were demoralized. Confused and uncertain about our prospects in a new country, three decades on, and now we have, by and large, been successful in making Australia our second home, much like other groups of migrants and refugees here. We have demonstrated that vulnerable people wanting to have a better life for themselves. And their children should not be seen simply as a burden and a liability to a society. They can become great contributors and builders of this nation. The experience of the Vietnamese refugees is clear evidence that even the most traumatized and the most impoverished group can be integrated in our multicultural society and can make a positive contribution. I feel saddened by the toxic atmosphere, inflamed by the politics of fear, which、uh, underlies our nation's response to the plight of the asylum seekers at the moment. I often ask: Have we forgotten the lesson of history? Have we become a mean-spirited nation? Where is our sense of fair go and the legendary support for the underdog? Where is the spirit of compassion and solidarity that has marked the history of this country from its very humble beginnings? So we Catholics certainly have some work to do in relation to these questions. God works even more mysteriously,、uh, mysteriously as far as the role of the Vietnamese Catholics 
in our church here in Australia is concerned. You know, at my ordination to uh, the Episcopate, I made a tongue-in-cheek remark that we are the new Irish. And I think that is uh, true in some unexpected ways. And you know, um, Ireland had a surplus of priests once upon a time, and many of these uh, would come and fill the gap in Australia. Now, it seems to be the Vietnamese turn to change the Eurocentric face of the Catholic Church in this country. The numbers speak for themselves. We have um, something like 150 Vietnamese priests in Australia. A rather disproportionate uh, figure given a much smaller percentage of Vietnamese Catholics here. Similarly, the seminaries and religious institutes across the country often experience uh, the same phenomenon. Ordinary Vietnamese Catholics too are making their presence felt, like these uh, young people who are making their presence felt here tonight. Wherever they are, there is more participation and vitality than otherwise possible. And I guess you could say the same about the Filipinos, the East Timorese, the Maltese, Italians before, and other groups who are known for their piety. What is unique about us is the experience of trauma, but also the experience of grace and redemption in some very dramatic circumstances. So with due respect for, uh, to the Jewish people, I make a bold analogy between their experience in exile and our own refugee experience. Like them, we experience the horror and shame of alienation. And like them, we yearn for liberation and restoration of our nation. Like them, we were determined to rebuild our lives and our sense of identity. And ultimately, like them, we have a sense of mission in relation to our place in the new society and in the local church. And that mission consists in our witness to freedom, to faith, to the core human values. So the words of the psalm take on an added meaning for us. The stone which has been rejected by the builders has become the cornerstone. Indeed, our humble beginnings have turned out to be our assets. The rejected stone has turned out to be the cornerstone. It is the very crucible of suffering and pain that fashion and mold us into more effective instruments of faith and hope. So I'd like to end this part of my reflection with an Easter story from my own lived experience. During my childhood, Easter, you know, was often associated with long and fearful nights spent in the family shelter. And kids here in Australia, you know, when they think of Easter, they often think of uh, uh, things that uh, give pleasure to the test buds. Think of chocolates, think of um, holidays and the like. Uh, when we were kids during the war, it's not the case. So when the sound of artillery and gunfire pierced through the night, mum and dad would bundle us up and still half asleep, they would take us into this moldy little shelter, bomb shelter, built under every house virtually. And you think that's a bad experience for us, but it's actually much worse for dad. He had to go down still further into this a small hole dug out under the, the basement and put the, the lid over it. And we children were instructed every time not to tell anyone about his hideout. So those nights in the pitch dark bomb shelter were long and frightening. And I often thought to myself, will the morning ever come? Will there be the end of these nights of terror? You know, when we are overwhelmed by crisis and despair, it is hard to see or to believe anything beyond the present. 
And that's exactly how I felt as a child during the war. So I wonder whether Jesus too felt that in the same way as he was hanging on the cross. Through all the pain and the, the, the humiliation and insult, would he feel that he would be finally vindicated? Was there even the slightest hint of the resurrection? Or was the agony of it all made even worse by the conviction that that was the end and that even God had forsaken him? My God, my God, why have you abandoned me? So it seems to me that human beings can never be so sure that things will be alright at the end. We may believe that they are going to be okay, we may have faith in the future, but there is always that nagging doubt, that recurring sense of uncertainty. And there are times that are so tragic that we may be convinced that things will never be the same again. Times when we are caught up in the sea of troubles, relationship breakdowns, work pressures, financial disasters, personal, family tragedies. You know, not long ago I visited a young couple who had two children with severe cerebral palsy. And these were unable to perform even basic functions. They could not walk, could not hear or speak. They could not even feed themselves. And yet, what amazed me was the sense of devotion, the meticulous care that the parents gave to their children. And they told me that they'd done this for not one year, but 20 long years. It's still counting. Even if the cost, mentally, physically, financially and otherwise, was immense, they could never give up on their children. And it's something that only parents can do. So for me, this is the Paschal mystery unfolding itself in real life. Yes, I believe the resurrection did not just happen 2,000 years ago, but it happens now in our lives, in our experiences. It is enacted in the story of the Vietnamese refugees who overcame all odds and rebuilt their shattered lives. It is reenacted in the story of the couple who saw a loving child instead of just a futureless or a lifetime liability. In fact, it is being reenacted in every one of us who endeavors to hold out our Christian hope in the crucible of life's pain and misery. The Easter story is about Jesus overcoming death. Jesus vindicated and restored to dignity and glory, but it did not end as a historical fact alone or a tenet of the Christian faith. It continues. It continues to unfold in our lives and in our world. So I say yes, I believe in Jesus Christ crucified and risen today. I believe that suffering is not the end of everything. The death and resurrection of Jesus continue to guide you and me in our journeys of life.